We left off last time discussing the market multiples approach. This time, we'll discuss the discounted cash flows valuation method. I'll introduce you to the three forms of the discounted cash flows method, and then we'll use some examples. Then, we'll go through some valuations in the real world. But first, let's review the steps in the discounted cash flow procedure. Now, we have four steps in the discounted cash flows procedure. First, we need to estimate the line items necessary to calculate cash flows. Then, we need to estimate our cash flows or dividends if you prefer. We'll primarily focus on free cash flows in our real world examples. There are two types of cash flows, free cash flows to the firm and free cash flows to equity. These are known as FCFF and FCFE respectively. Now the FCFF are the free cash flows generated by the firm while the free cash flows to equity represent the cash flows that only flow to the shareholders. Our third step is to estimate the discount rate. If we're using the free cash flows to the firm method, we want to use the weighted average cost of capital. Whereas if we're using the free cash flows to equity method, we want to use the cap M to estimate our discount rate. Finally, we need to discount our expected free cash flows by the discount rate and produce our intrinsic value. So let's describe these steps in greater detail. Step one involves us forecasting the line items on the income statement and balance sheet that we can use to estimate our cash flows or dividends. There are two approaches we can use. The first is the line item approach. In this approach, we estimate each line item for the next several years by looking through macroeconomic, industry, and firm level sources. For example, reading through the firm's MD&A statement on the 10K might give us a sense of the growth rate in operating expenses and sales in the coming years for our firm. The other method we can use is the percent of sales approach. In this approach, we forecast future sales of the firm and then assume that the other line items on the income statement will grow at the same rate. So how do we get this sales growth information? There are two broad ways you can forecast sales growth of a firm. The first is the naive approach. In this approach, you assume the firm will continue to grow its sales revenue at the same rate that it had over the previous years. This should be your method of last resort since the firm's past position is likely to be different than its current position and its growth opportunities and macroeconomic environment might have changed as well. The second and arguably preferable method is to use your own best judgment and forecast sales growth. We can use a variety of resources such as the MD&A statement analyst forecasts, or we can even look at guidance that the firm's management itself has put out. For example, let's take a look at Apple's revenue growth on Yahoo Finance. All right, so we're here on Yahoo Finance, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to analysis. And as you can see, we have a large number of analysts following Apple at this point in time. So there are currently 30 analysts that have given estimates of the firm's quarterly earnings expectations, so that's the net income per share or earnings per share. And down here we have the revenue estimates. So there are 28 analysts estimating future revenue of Apple. And so the average consensus is about $56.55 billion in sales revenue. Over the next year, that fiscal year revenue is going to be about 274 billion. So if you wanted to, you could use this number and compare the change between last year's sales revenue and this year's estimated sales revenue. And if you wanted to, you could even look at next sale, next year's sales revenue. Once we have our line item information, we need to estimate our dividends or cash flows. The reason we estimate these is because they represent the cash that shareholders have generated. Now, notice here that I've said cash. This is one very important difference between finance and accounting. In accounting, the focus is on accounting earnings, or net income, which are adjusted for non-cash expenses, like depreciation or amortization. In finance, we focus on cash flows. We want to know how much you as a shareholder can receive in hard currency. In step three, we calculate the discount rate to be used in our model. The discount rate is the return that an investor requires to compensate them for the investment's risk. The riskier the cash flows are, the higher the discount rate will be. 
Now, keep in mind, in valuation work, we use the term discount rate, but depending on what is in our numerator, we could use either the required rate of return calculated using the cap M, or we could use the weighted average cost of capital. In cases where all the cash flows are available to shareholders, we're going to let our discount rate be the required rate of return calculated using the cap M. So you can see that formula right here. However, when we use free cash flows to the firm later, we'll use the weighted average cost of capital as our discount rate. Now one final point to note is that in valuation work, the required rate of return is also known as the market capitalization or market cap rate for short. Now let's take a look at our most general discounted cash flow model. In this model, we estimate our free cash flows for each of the next several years and discount them back to the present. The discounted value will be the intrinsic value of the firm's cash flows. So that P, that would be the expected price of stock today, of our stock today, assuming that it was fairly valued. So P would be our intrinsic share price. In the dividend discount model, we replace our free cash flows with dividends and discount them at the required rate of return, calculated using the cap M. We discount these dividends at the required rate of return because dividends are paid only to shareholders. Now, one problem that we face with this model, as with all discounted cash flows models, is that we have to estimate all future cash flows off into the future, forever. This presents a problem, since conditions in the future can change, and we don't want to have to estimate every future cash flow off into infinity. So let's take a look at three popular forms of this model that we use in practice. When we perform valuation work in the real world, we often use one of these three forms. Each of them makes a different assumption about the growth rate in future cash flows. In the zero growth model, we assume cash flows don't increase or decrease. In the constant growth model, we assume cash flows grow by a certain percentage every quarter or every year. And in the variable growth model, we assume that the cash flows generated by the firm will change at a non-constant rate. Now let's go through each of these and look at an example. Like I said, in the zero growth model, we assume that the current dividend or cash flow stays the same going forward. There are several examples of this in the real world, but the most commonly used example is that of a preferred stock whose dividend doesn't change. The shareholder receives the same dividend every period. The way we calculate the intrinsic value per share is by taking the dividend and dividing by the required rate of return. This formula is one of the most useful formulas in finance, and it's called the perpetuity formula. Now let's take a look at an example. So you know GE just issued a total of $1.10 in dividends last year. The firm also announced that it would never adjust the dividend. The firm's required rate of return is 11.4%. What is the intrinsic price per share of GE stock? All right, so I'm going to move over to Excel and work this over there. All right, so to work this, we need to know the annual dividend. And in this case, it is $1.10. We know the required rate of return is 11.4%. And so to get our price per share, all we have to do is just divide our dividend that occurs every year by the required rate of return. Or in this case, that would also be our discount rate. So in this case, the price that we would want to pay for this stock or GE stock is $9.65. The next model we have is the constant growth model. This model assumes that our cash flows or dividends grow by a constant percentage each year. We often use this formula when we're trying to value stocks that pay a regular dividend. This means that this formula is best suited to large, profitable stocks. In this formula, we take the dividend that was just paid and multiply it by the expected dividend growth rate, G. Then we divide that by the quantity of our discount rate minus our growth rate. Now, note that we can also use the expected future dividend in the numerator if we want to, since uh, this dividend next year is going to be equal to the dividend this year times 1 plus G. So that's what that D1 is. It's just the dividend next year. This model is often known as the Gordon growth model, and it is certainly a model that you should remember going forward. Now let's take a look at an example that you might be asked by the CFA on their level one exam. So in this example, Peter is considering the purchase of a common stock. The current annual dividend is 3.5 euros, 
and the dividend is expected to grow at a 5% annual rate. If the required return is 7%, the intrinsic value of the stock is closest to, well, let's move over to Excel to find the answer. So in this case, we know that our dividend, our D0, is three dollars and or three euro, three and a half euros. We know that our growth rate is five percent, and we know that our required return, in this case our discount rate, is seven percent. So our intrinsic price per share is going to be just our dividend paid times one plus our growth rate all divided by our required return, which is in cell C6, minus our growth rate. Close our parentheses, and now we have an intrinsic price per share. So in this case, the answer is going to be A. Now, there's a couple of points you should know about the constant growth or Gordon growth model. First, the larger the past or expected dividend per share, the larger the intrinsic value. Likewise, the higher the growth rate, the higher the intrinsic value. However, the higher the required rate of return, the lower the intrinsic value, because you're discounting by a higher interest rate. In addition to knowing how each component of the constant growth DDM affects intrinsic values, you should also know that this model is often inaccurate in valuing stocks by itself and should at best be used in conjunction with other more accurate models. So let's try one more CFA question. So in what phase of its life cycle will it be most appropriate to value a company using the Gordon growth model? A, a growth, the growth period, B, the maturity period, or C, the declining period. So as it becomes le the firm becomes more obsolete. Well, hopefully you said B. And the reason the answer is B here is because so hopefully you said the answer here was B. And the reason it's B is because firms that are in the mature state of their life cycle, their cash flows are fairly constant. Maybe they grow at about one or two percent per year. And so you can it the valuation you get using the Gordon growth model is gonna be much more accurate when you know that they're the cash flows and then the dividends of this firm are growing at a constant rate, often to perpetuity. Answers A and C are incorrect because firms that are either rapidly growing or rapidly declining, those firms, their, their growth rate, both in terms of revenue and cash flows and then also in, in terms of dividends, that's not sustainable. I mean, you can't sustain a 10 or 15% dividend growth rate forever. As well, I mean, if a firm is in decline, chances are it's it's going to not have the cash to be able to make dividend payments for ever. I mean, it's it's just not feasible. So answer B is the correct answer here. Now let's talk about how we estimate a firm's dividend or cash flow growth rate. There are three methods that are most prominent. The first is to estimate them yourself, either through analysis of the firm or by naively assuming that the firm's dividends will continue to grow at the same rate that they have in the past. The second method is to use analyst expectations to collect this information. The problem is that you're relying on others who might be inaccurate in their estimation. Finally, you can multiply the firm's return on equity by its retention ratio to determine the growth rate. Let's take a look at this in a little more detail. Now, using the return on equity, or the ROE, and the retention ratio involves us using the this formula, the one that you see right here. We estimate the retention ratio as one minus the dividend payout ratio, or just the dividends divided by earnings per share. The larger the percentage of net income a firm is paying out to shareholders, the smaller the percentage of net income it has available to reinvest in new capital budgeting projects. Now let's take a look at an example. So IBM's dividend payout ratio is 97.28%. The firm's ROE is 28.82%. What is the firm's expected dividend growth rate? Well, in this case, all we have to do is identify the ROE, which is pretty obvious, 28.82%. And our dividend payout ratio is 97.28%. So for every dollar of net income, we're paying out 97 cents. And so all we're gonna do is we are going to take our ROE, 
and multiply that by 1 minus our dividend payout ratio, which is cell H5. And so in this case, what we're finding is that our growth rate will be about 0.78%. So this is really why you, if you're trying, if you're looking for firms that are growing and you want to know which firm is going to have the highest growth rate, you're usually looking for firms that have a fairly low dividend payout ratio. So if I were to adjust our dividend payout ratio to, let's say, 5%, as you can see, our dividend growth rate will skyrocket. Now let's take a look at two more examples that require us to put everything together to estimate the intrinsic value of a stock. In this first example, you're trying to estimate the value of Sony, and you know the firm's beta is 1.5. You know the risk-free rate is 1.5%, and the market risk premium will be 6%. Sony's ROE is 14%, and the firm's dividend payout ratio is 80%. The firm's current dividend per share is $3.50. So we're going to use the DDM to calculate the intrinsic value of Sony. Now, here, as you can see, we've got a beta and a risk premium and an ROE. So what we're going to be using is third method to get our growth rate that we just talked about. And since we have a beta, we're still going to need to estimate our discount rate, and we're going to estimate that using the cap M. So that's why we have this beta and the risk-free rate and the market risk premium in here. All right, let's break this down. So our expected return or required return or market cap rate in this case is going to be calculated using our beta which was 1.5 times our market risk premium which was 6% and to that we're going to add our risk free rate which was 1.5% and so that'll get us a market cap rate or required rate of return of 10.5% our growth rate is going to be calculated using our ROE and our retention ratio. Remember our ROE was 14% and our retention ratio was, well, 0.2 since our dividend payout ratio was 80%. Lastly, we're going to plug this information into our Gordon Growth Model or Constant Growth Dividend Discount Model as some people refer to it as. Now our D0 here was $3.50 we are going to add, multiply that by 1 plus the G that we just calculated, so 0.28, and our discount rate is up here. That's the thing that we use the cap M to get, and so we're left with $3.50 times 1.028 divided by 10.5% minus 2.8%, and that'll get us an intrinsic value of $46.73 per share. So in this case, if the share price is higher than this, this would indicate that the share price is possibly overvalued, or this the stock is possibly overvalued. If the share price is lower than $46.73, this might indicate that the stock is actually undervalued. It might be a, an asset that we might want to add to our portfolio. All right, let's try one more example. So in this example, a stock is currently selling for $15 a share, and the firm's earnings per share in the next year are expected to be $1.00 and the firm is expected to pay out 50 cents of 50% of its earnings in the form of an annual dividend. The ROE is 12%, the yield on the one-year T-bill is 2%, and the risk premium is 6%, and the firm's beta is 1.3. What is our intrinsic value? Well, in this case, we've got all the information necessary to use the cap M and get our market cap rate. We also have enough information on the firm's earnings and dividend payout ratio and return on equity to be able to calculate our growth rate. So let's move over to Excel and answer this question. All right, so let's start off with the market cap rate. In this case, we know that our beta is 1.3. We also know that the risk premium is 6%. We know that our yield on the T-bill is 2%. And that'll get us our market cap rate, also known as the required rate of return, because it's the return that investors expect for this level of risk. So all we're going to do is we're going to take our risk-free rate plus our firm's beta times the market risk premium, and that'll get us a market cap rate of 9.8%. Next, let's get our growth rate. So our ROE in this case is given as 12%. 
We also know that the firm had a dividend payout ratio of 50%. And so the retention ratio is going to be 1 minus that, so equals 1 minus 50%, so still 50%. And our G here, our growth rate, is going to be equal to our ROE times our dividend payout ratio, so 6%. Now, we're ready to calculate the intrinsic value using the constant growth dividend discount model, otherwise known as the Gordon growth model. So, all we're going to do is we're going to take the firm's expected dividend payout, in this case, a dollar, and this time, rather than multiplying it by 1 plus g, we're going to just divide that by r minus g. The reason we're not going to multiply our numerator dividend by 1 plus g is because this expected dividend is the dividend that will happen, that will be paid out next year. It's already 1 plus g times our current dividend or our most recently paid dividend. So I'm just going to take our market cap rate minus our growth rate in cell C11. And that will get us our answer. And our answer is $26.32. So this will give us a sense of whether or not this stock is currently under or overvalued. So in this case, since this stock is selling at $15 a share, this model would indicate that this stock is severely undervalued. Now, obviously, we don't want to rely on just one model because, you know, maybe the firm's Dividends don't grow by, six, we'll say, 6% a year. Maybe that's not realistic. So we always want to try other models. We want to try sensitivity analysis, etc. Now let's discuss our final set of discounted cash flow models, the ones where we allow the cash flows to adjust in the future. These models can take a number of different forms. However, what you're looking at is one of the most popular forms. This is the two-stage discounted cash flows model. In this model, we break up the future during which we're expected to receive cash flows into two periods, a forecasting period where we directly adjust the cash flows, and a terminal value period where we use the Gordon growth model to estimate the value of the remaining cash flows. The reason we do this is because it's much easier to estimate cash flows in the next two to five years than ten years from now. Therefore, after about year five, we assume that cash flows will grow by what we call the long-term growth rate. Since this long-term growth rate is constant, we can use the Gordon growth model and discount all future cash flows after year 5 back to year 5, and then discount that value back to the present. Now, before we use this model, let's take a look at some key points related to it. First, keep in mind that most firms don't pay dividends. This means that we're not going to be using dividends in our estimation, but free cash flows. There are two models for free cash flows, free cash flows to the firm, or FCFF, and free cash flows to equity. The FCFF models will require us to use the weighted average cost of capital as our discount rate, since those cash flows represent cash flows that can be paid to either stockholders or bondholders. Finally, the two-stage discounted cash flows model is arguably the most appropriate model to use when valuing firms that are expected to have variable growth rates in the immediate future, but then have constant growth rates later in the future. When we estimate the free cash flows to the firm, we follow these steps. Step 1, estimate the cash flows for the next 3 to 5 years. We calculate our free cash flows to the firm as the earnings before interest and taxes, or operating income, times 1 minus the firm's corporate tax rate. Then we add in depreciation. We do this because depreciation expense is a non-cash expense. It's already been subtracted from earnings before interest and taxes. So to get an accurate measure of the cash generated by the firm during the period, we need to add it back in. Then we subtract the amount spent on capital expenditures during the year, as well as any increases in net working capital. Next, we estimate the value of the terminal value period cash flows by either using the Gordon growth model or the market multiples method and a comparable firm. After we have our cash flows measured, we discount them all by the weighted average cost of capital. The value we get is the intrinsic enterprise value of the firm. It represents the total intrinsic value of the firm's assets. To determine how much a firm should be worth per share, we still need to subtract the debt 
and add the cash to determine the intrinsic value of the firm's equity. Finally, we need to divide the intrinsic value of equity by the number of shares outstanding. Now, admittedly, this is a long process, but the payoff is great when we get it right. Now, we need to calculate the weighted average cost of capital to use the free cash flows to the firm in the discounted cash flows model. Therefore, we need to make sure we know how the weighted average cost of capital is calculated. As you hopefully recall from your introductory finance course, weighted average cost of capital represents the cost to the firm for raising capital. Ideally, we want to use the most forward-looking measures of each component you see listed, so we'll try to use market values when we can. We start off estimating the weights of debt and equity. These represent the percentage of total firm capital that is provided by debt and equity respectively. Now, remember that we want to use market values if possible, so I'll always use the market cap if the firm is publicly traded. In most cases, the total debt on the balance sheet is going to be, be the best number we can use for debt, since the book value of debt is frequently close to the market value of debt. Next, we multiply the weight of debt by the cost of debt, RD. This is the yield to maturity that the firms can expect to pay if they issue the new bond. It's best proxied by the current yield to maturity on the firm's most senior bond. Finally, we multiply these by 1 minus the marginal tax rate. We do this because interest on debt is tax deductible, meaning that if the firm makes a coupon payment to a bondholder, it doesn't have to pay taxes on that interest. In other words, having more debt increases the tax deduction and thus reduces the cost of debt and the overall weighted average cost of capital. On the equity side, we multiply the weight of equity by the market capitalization rate, also known as the required or expected rate of return. That is, the expected return we can get when we use the cap M. Now, there is a fast way to do this if you have access to Bloomberg, and that is to use the weighted average cost of capital formula. This formula allows us to see the current weighted average cost of capital of a firm, as well as the past WACC. The other free cash flow formula we have is free cash flow to equity, or FCFE. This represents the cash flow remaining after a firm has paid all of its expenses and makes necessary improvements in working capital and fixed assets. If you're wondering how the FCFF and the FCFE formulas relate to one another, wonder no more. If you know the FCFF of the firm and you want to know the FCFE, all you need to do is subtract the cash flows received by the bondholders from the FCFF. That includes both interest expense, adjusted for the benefit of the tax deduction, and the change in total debt. Once we have our FCFEs, all we need to do is discount them at the market capitalization rate and divide by the number of shares outstanding, and we'll be left with the intrinsic value of equity per share. Alright, now I think we're ready to actually take a look at a two-stage discounted cash flows valuation in the real world. So. To do this, I'm going to look at a firm that we've already seen, Macy's, as of the end of fiscal year 2018, and I'm going to value this firm using both the free cash flows to the firm and the FCFE methods. So I'm going to move over to Excel, where I've already collected historical balance sheet and income statement data, and I'll walk us through it. Alright, so here's our two-stage discounted cash flows valuation. So let's start over here with the historical financial statements. So what I've done is what you normally do when you use the two-stage discounted cash flows model. You pull the historical data. So in this case, I have the income statements going back four years. And I also have down here the balance sheet over the last four years. So we have really everything we need historically. Next, so that's step one or rather that gets us to step one. Step one involves us estimating our line items. So our total revenue, our total operating expenses, and then finally our EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes, and then getting all of the other line items that we need to estimate our, depreci our depreciation, our change in capital expenditure, and our change in working capital. All right, so to forecast our line items going forward. So keep in mind, we are right here. We're between fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019 being reported. So we need, our goal is to estimate these next five years worth of line items. And to do that, what I've done is I've used the percent of sales approach. 
So remember, in this approach, I assumed that our sales will grow by a certain percentage. In this case, 0.5%. And I did this by using analyst reports. I looked at the mean analyst report at the time that I pulled this data. And I assumed that sales will grow at 0.5% every year for the next five years. And the change in all the other line items under percent of under sales revenue will grow by the same percent. So if I click in here, all we're doing is we're saying that last year the uh, expenses, our total operating expenses, represented 93.8% of sales revenue, and we're going to keep that ratio that that number the same. So we're multiplying our sales revenue or expected sales revenue in fiscal year 2019 by our expense margin from the previous year, and that'll get us our expected total operating expenses. Now, further down here, I've made a number of other assumptions. Feel free to go through the spreadsheet on your own. Uh, so, for example, as we get closer to our PPE, I've had to assume that our property, plant, and equipment will grow by a certain percentage. In this case, I had to make an assumption of what PPE growth was going to be going forward. So in order to do that, what I did was I assumed that PPE growth would be about consistent with what it was over the past three years. So negative 5.37%. And then I forecasted that growth rate going out five years. I did more or less the same with the networking capital. So networking capital, I just took last year's networking capital and multiplied it by one plus the change in networking capital that is just a historical average here. And then down here at the bottom, what I've done is I've used the free cash flows to the firm method. So I've taken our earnings before interest and taxes plus our depreciation expense, which is zero in this case because, well, that PPE number that we had earlier, that was net PPE. In other words, uh, it's, it's already been taken into account, or depreciation has already been taken into account. So I, I didn't need to include depreciation in this case. Uh, so our depreciation change is just going to be, is just next year's PPE, or fiscal year 2019's PPE, minus fiscal year 2018's PPE. And the change in networking capital is just networking capital from 2019, minus networking capital from 2018. And that's how we get our free cash flows to the firm over the next five years. Now, to get our terminal value cash flows, what I've gone ahead and done is I've taken our free cash flows to the firm in year five and used the Gordon growth model. So in this case, this free cash flow to the firm in year five is akin to our, our D0 in the Gordon growth model we're going to assume that our free cash flows to the firm continue to grow at a constant growth rate of, up here in cell D3, 2%. The reason I chose 2% is because this is the long-term US GDP growth rate, or the expected GDP growth rate. Now down here further, uh, you can see that I made an assumption about the weighted average cost of capital. So Cell D2 is where I put our weighted average cost of capital, and I assumed that it was going to be 6%. I'll explain why in a second. All right, so once I have that, all I need to do is sum up all of our cash flows in each year, and then I'm going to, down here, complete our free cash flows to the firm method. So I have our shares outstanding that we'll use in a second, and our NPV is just our free cash flows to the firm discounted using the NPV formula in Excel at our weighted average cost of capital. So remember, our, when we're using the FCFF method, our discount rate is the weighted average cost of capital. So in this case, I've used the NPV method and our interest rate or our, our discount rate is just the weighted average cost of capital and we highlight our cash flows. And this represents essentially the enterprise value or the intrinsic enterprise value of the firm. We still have to remove the debt, add the cash, and that will get us our intrinsic market value of equity. This represents the intrinsic value of all the firm's equity. Now to get our, our, our intrinsic price per share, we still have to 
divide that number by the number of shares outstanding, which in this case is 306,970. So in this case, that's exactly what I did. So the discounted cash flows method here would tell us, or the free cash flows to the firm method would tell us that the intrinsic price per share is 6%. All right, now let's try getting our intrinsic value using the FCFE formula. So in this case, what we're going to do is we are going to use our free cash flows to the firm, and we're going to subtract from that the change in total debt, and we're also going to subtract out any interest expense that the firm paid. So in this case, Macy's had an interest expense of 361500 or 361000 uh, So we're going to remove that from our free cash flows to the firm because that's being paid out to the bondholders. Now, we're still estimating all of our free cash flows out five years, and we're estimating our terminal value period the same way using the Gordon growth model. And when we do this, we're going to sum up all of our free cash flows to equity for each year, and we're going to discount them at our market cap rate, or our required rate of return. And in this case, I'm just going to assume that our required rate of return is 9%. Uh, I haven't done the legwork on this uh, particular one yet, but we'll see how this thing adjusts here in a second. Now, once I've done this, our intrinsic value of the market value of the equity, it, our intrinsic value of the equity of the firm is about 21, this is in thousands, so 21 billion, shares outstanding about 307 million, and so when I divide that, what we get is an intrinsic share price of 70.99, which is a little higher than their share price as of the time that I uh, pulled this data, I believe it was somewhere in the 20s or so. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at what changes these values the most, our, our intrinsic values the most. So to help us out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up our, I'm going to link our FCFF intrinsic value and our FCFE intrinsic value up here at the top. And let's see how each of these reacts to a change in the weighted average cost of capital or the required rate of return, since FCFF is only using weighted average cost of capital. Well, I just set a, a basic weighted average cost of capital here of 6%. Uh, chances are the weighted average cost of capital of Macy's could be either higher or lower. So let's set here, let's say it's... Oh, we'll say 4%. Actually, it's probably higher given that Macy's is a retail firm and it is severely pressured by online retailers. So let's say that the weighted average cost of capital is something more akin to like 8%. In that case, the share price of this falls significantly. So from 6%, it jumped up to, jumped down to, uh, jumped from, six to eight percent and you can see the value of the firm the intrinsic value of the firm declines significantly at the same time uh that long-term growth rate may not be appropriate i just use the the long-term growth rate set by the or determined by the gdp growth rate long term in the u.s uh and if i drop this to zero which is probably even even that's probably re uh optimistic as you can see the uh you know, the, the intrinsic value of Macy's falls significantly. Uh, now, hopefully that gives you a sense of how these, how these values change as our discount rate or growth rate change. I mean, quite frankly, a change in any of these numbers is going to change our intrinsic values, but not nearly as much as our, our discount rate or our growth rate. So the big takeaway here is that, uh, the weighted average cost of capital and the long-term growth rate are easily going to have the biggest impact on your intrinsic values. And unfortunately, because these models are really large, I mean, you do have to make a sizable number of assumptions and simplifications uh, when you're actually building these things out. Uh, there's actually a 
two-stage discounted cash flows uh, generator in Bloomberg. It's under the XDCF function. So if you want to use that, feel free to ask me how. I It's actually quite uh, quite elaborate, and it does more or less everything that you saw me do here. Now that you've seen how free cash flows model can be used in practice, it's time to discuss some finer points. What you've seen is just the tip of what can be done in valuation. We can also perform sensitivity analysis and estimate what happens in various scenarios. Uh, we can also use a three-stage approach if we believe that the growth rate will change multiple times. Next, for simplification, you can also use analyst earnings and sales growth rate estimates if need be. Uh, however, remember that just because someone is an analyst doesn't mean that their information is accurate. Also, you should keep in mind some basic points that I likely only mentioned implicitly. First, changes in capex, depreciation, and networking capital are often not consistent. You might see very large increases or decreases from year to year. Second, Keep in mind that EBIT, or earnings before interest and taxes, is often called er operating income on some financial statements. Third, you should use either the, uh, if you are trying to estimate your tax rate, you should assume that the future tax rate of the firm will be similar to the current tax rate of the firm if you don't know the exact uh, tax rate, since the firm's operations likely won't change that much from year to year. Next, you should use Normally, the, the long-term expected GDP growth rate in whatever economy that you're looking at or the industry growth rate as your G in the model. Uh, in this case, I started out using the expected GDP growth rate, and then I mentioned that that's probably not appropriate for a firm like Macy's in the retail industry. Finally, if possible, use scenario analysis to determine what happens in adverse or positive economic conditions. So in other words, in some cases, you actually want to have as many as three or four or more scenarios that calculate the intrinsic value if there's, let's say, a coronavirus outbreak or, let's say, Amazon steals more market share of the retail industry, etc. Finally, keep in mind that in practice, you and every other analyst will be forced into making simplifying assumptions. In many cases, you will have incomplete information, so you have to make do with what you have. Also, keep in mind that a small change in your inputs, particularly your long-term growth rate and your discount rate, will drive your intrinsic value, so you need to be as accurate as possible with those numbers. Now, the last method I should mention in this section is the book value or asset value method. In this method, you use the book value of the firm's assets to determine its value. This method is only appropriate when you're valuing a firm that has no intangibles. The best example I can give you is that of a fruit stand. Now, if you wanted to buy the stand, uh, what you'd have to do is you'd have to pay the value of the fruit plus the value of the stand, and that's about it. I mean, this method is occasionally used for valuing firms close to bankruptcy since they might have to sell their assets under Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Uh, but that's really about it. I mean, this method is used extremely infrequently. Uh, it's, it's certainly not appropriate to use when a firm is a going concern. In other words, it's, it's going to be around for a while. All right. Now, if you're not tired of hearing about valuation and you want my personal advice as a value investor, here it is. Use GDP growth as your, your primary G, if at all possible. And in some cases, like the retail industry, obviously that's not going to be appropriate, but in most cases you're safe. I mean, usually when I do my own valuation work and uh, buy and sell stocks using the model that you just used, uh, I tend to use that that long-term GDP growth rate of about 2%, two, two, uh, maybe 2.5% if it's firm with a, a very high growth rate, maybe an Amazon or something like that. Uh, next, use several methods to determine your intrinsic value. This is a good idea since an error or inaccurate information in one DCF model could lead you to make a poor investment decision. I always use every model at my disposal when I invest in stocks. Uh, so not just the, the FCFF model, but the FCFE model, as well as market multiples and maybe even the, the Gordon growth model, although I, I do take that one with a grain of, a grain of salt. Finally, when investing in certain stocks, weigh certain models more heavily. For example, when you're valuing high-growth firms like tech stocks, focus more on the market multiples est estimates rather than the DCF estimates, because the DCF requires you to estimate future cash flows, which is difficult when growth rates are high and probably very volatile. 
Also, if a firm is unprofitable, you're going to want to use the price to sales ratio in the market multiples method. All right, so that's that. So to summarize what we discussed, there are three discount dividend discount models or free cash flow models, the no growth, the constant growth, and the variable growth model. And there's certain scenarios where some are going to be more appropriate than others. For, per, for perpetuities, that's where you use the no growth model. Blue chip stocks that are in mature industries, that's where you use constant growth. And then variable growth is where you use where you try to value most other firms that have information about future cash flows. Uh, also, you're going to want to use the free cash flows formulas whenever possible, simply because if you have complete information, they're going to be the most accurate models that you have access to. Now, in practice, you're going to want to use the two-stage discounted cash flows model to value firms as opposed to the constant growth model. And the reason for this is because it allows you to adjust that growth rate uh, based on the fact that the, the firm's growth rate won't always be consistent forever. And finally, the most important considerations when you use that two-stage discounted cash flows model are your long-term growth rate and your discount rate. You want to be as accurate as possible for those, and so you always want to use market information. So you want to use, uh, for the discount rate, you want to use uh, the most forward-looking information, and for your G, you want to try and estimate a growth rate that's obviously as accurate as possible using one of the three methods that we talked about. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or uh, set up a Zoom session with me. I'd be happy to discuss this material with you or even just meet with you in the office. So anyways, fine by me, and I hope that you got something out of this. Thank you.